Good evening, everybody. We are continuing our meeting. We just uh, finished up our executive session. I'm going to go off agenda for just a second, and I would like to make an announcement because I know we're going to have some public comments, and I want to make sure I cover one particular thing um, quickly. Um, as many of you know, we hired Ray and Associates to um, help us in our search for a new superintendent. And it seems like the process is going pretty well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nearly 400 um, survey takers. So if you haven't gone in on the website and taken the survey, please take the survey. It's very valuable to us, and it helps us better understand um, the profile and the type of person we need to actually hire. Um, I think it also needs to be mentioned that we hired Ray and Associates because they can bring a very large, diverse pool of candidates to us. There's some talk on the street that we are only interested in a candidate of a certain race and gender, and that is not the case. We want the best candidate we can possibly find. We're still figuring this out as far as our profile goes. Uh, we are meeting on Thursday evening at 6 o'clock to sort of discuss the findings of the survey. The goal is to get the profile out into the community. I mean, so applicants can actually start applying for the job um, beginning next week. So we are ready and willing. Um, the application, I mean, just to refresh everybody, the, the application process goes through the end of January, and then at that point the fund begins. We're hopeful to get at least 60 candidates, so there's a lot of work that we have to do with Ray to kind of go through that. But I just wanted to sort of just reiterate some of this just so everybody understands. For uh, the members of the community that uh, met with Rain Associates over the last two days, they were here doing personal interviews. We thank you very, very much for that. So to continue our meeting, we have awards and recognitions. Okay. So good evening, everyone. Good evening. So tonight we will start with um, a celebrating a milestone in our career tech at High Tight. So the automotive technology program recently achieved its automotive service technology certification. And instructor Jeff Porter is with us tonight to talk about what that means for the future of our program. So Mr. Porter, would you please come up and share with us? And you brought some students. Great. Thank you. Let's give them a hand. Thank you. Our program uh, went through reaccreditation at the beginning of the school year, and we were certified at a general maintenance level program. Uh, when they came in, the national level was so <laughs> impressed with the new facility that the district has built at the Delio Option Center and the equipment that we have, they made recommendations at the national level that we move up to a college level certification, which is automotive service technology. Uh, what that does for our students, it just shows them that we are doing the right thing in that program, that we're teaching the right content, we have the right equipment, and we're meeting the industry standards. Uh, I brought some of my students with me, or they, they met me here tonight, and I'm going to have them introduce themselves, and they're going to tell you what certifications they are leaving. These are entry-level certifications, the same master certification I have with Automotive Service Excellence. They have student-level certifications, which gets them employed or sets them off you know, to go to a college like Stark State to get certified with Toyota or Tri-C has a GMA set program that the students can attend. There's numerous technical colleges or four-year colleges. They can go on to become automotive engineers, service technicians, business managers. There's a billion dollar business out there in automotive. So I, it's more about my students and the reason I push for the higher certification are for my kids. So I want to give them time to introduce themselves. Thank you. Hi guys, um, I'm Larry Garland. Uh, I have certifications in electrical, um, brakes and general maintenance. Yeah. Uh, my name is Jackson Hirschman. I have my certifications in G1 brakes, steering and suspension, and electrical. 
My name is Jordan Williams. I have certifications in general maintenance, electrical, and brakes. I, I would also like to thank Toyota. Uh, Chris Shepard is one of their technicians. It requires two people from industry with ASC certification and the national team that comes in and does the accreditation and looks at all the standards in the program. So Chris Shepard from Toyota and Kevin Suman from Washington Lee Service Center. We have to have an independent garage person and a dealership certified technician to come in plus the national team that comes in. Jackson and Larry were here to help me. They were host for the day when we did our certification and uh, walked people around, showed them our tools, our equipment, where everything was, and helped them find the stuff they needed so that we could achieve at this higher level. So I want to thank the board for all the support and everything that, that's done for us behind the scenes that I'm sure a lot that I don't know about goes on. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Wait. Got to do the picture. Photo. It didn't happen if it's not on Facebook. Okay, next we have our Tiger team members of the month. So each month we recognize employees who go above and beyond to create a culture of excellence in our district. Each honoree was nominated by a colleague and in some cases multiple colleagues. We receive 50 or more nominations every month, which are then voted upon by a committee of staff members. So we have several of the chosen honorees with us tonight. So when I read your name, please come forward. From Heights High Intervention Specialist, Karen Battle. It's not sure Karen is here. She's probably coaching girls basketball tonight. Let's give her a hand. <laughs> From the Delau Option Center, we have English teacher Denise Thompson. Is Denise with us tonight? Right. From Monticello at Heights Middle School, we have art teacher Angelique Troy. From Roxborough at Heights Middle School, Intervention Specialist Tristan Carrier. From Boulevard Elementary School, art teacher Danielle Camino. Is Danielle here? Yes, she's here. From Canterbury Elementary School, Principal Dr. Erica Wickton. Is Erica here? From Fairfax Elementary School, instructional coach Nancy McDonald. From Garrity Professional Development School, intervention specialist Brianne Merrill. From Noble Elementary School, administrative assistant Monique Worship. Monique. From Oxford, we have a cheerleader in the back. From <laughs> Oxford Elementary School, physical education teacher, Kim Hansen. <laughs> From Roxborough Elementary School, kindergarten teacher, Jennifer Musgrave Possmuth. All righty. <laughs> and from the Board of Education, High School Foundation Executive Director, Juliana Johnson Santera. <laughs> Have them all here, the ones that we have here. Thank you for coming, uh, um, coming out tonight, and thank you for all that you do uh, in this district. And this has been a phenomenal way to recognize your accomplishments. So thank you, thank you. And thank you, thank Jim. You. If you come for our picture.
Okay, so our seven scientists, I hope they're here. So we have seven young scientists who have spent time researching a potential environmental issue that they're facing in their own backyard, or should I say the parking lot. <laughs> so for the IB project this year, this group of Heights Middle School students worked to solve the problem of surface runoff on the middle school campus. Their, their teacher, Tiffany Underhall, is with them, and they're going to share their findings with us. So will those students come up, please? Let's give them a hand. You're going to start it. Hi there. Hello. Come on up. Good evening, Dr. Dixon, President Posh, Mr. Gaynor, and members of the CHUH board. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be here tonight. My name is Tiffany Underheil. I teach seventh grade science and design at Monticello Middle School. In seventh grade, one of our major standards that we discuss is earth and space science. And within that standard, students spend the majority of first quarter learning about water. They learn about the properties of water, the water cycle, surface water and runoff, they learn about groundwater, ocean currents, and probably most importantly, the human impact on water. To aid in their learning, all seventh grade students at Heights Middle School took part in our first IB design project this year. The project combined all of the content that students learned in our water unit and had them extend their learning through research and design. The task they were given was to study the impermeable surfaces on our campus and determine where they could add green infrastructure to our existing campus to allow for more permeable surfaces and of course reduce surface runoff. Students had to measure the areas they chose, research the cost of two different types of green infrastructure, and determine the cost of installing those types of green infrastructure on our current campus. They were not given a budget, but they did have to justify the amount of money they were spending. The students only had one week to research, design, build, and present their projects. Not only did they have to present their projects to their peers and their science teacher, but they had to present to building and board administration as well, which was quite the task for seventh graders. Um, so tonight I have with me two groups from my seventh grade science class. They scored the highest of all of my other groups on their IB rubric. They are here to present their green infrastructure designs to you. I cannot even begin to tell you how proud I am of them and their hard work, and I hope you enjoy what they bring tonight. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and members of the board. I'm Anaya Item. And I'm Ava Richards. Um, we have one other group member that couldn't make it. We hope she gets well, though, but this project is somewhat dedicated to her, too. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, one of the questions we get asked is, what is green infrastructure? Well, Green infrastructure is a cost-effective, resilient approach managing wet weather impacts that provides many community benefits. The benefits of green infrastructure include reducing of costs like sewage costs. Um, it also recharges groundwater, and it also boosts aesthetics. But I have a question. Um, are there disadvantages to green infrastructure? Well, the disadvantages are maintenance requirements. It also increases erosion during large storms events. Well, what are the different types of green infrastructure? The different types of green infrastructure include rainwater harvesting, rain gardens, permeable pavements, and green roofs, just to name a few. But I have a question, how much do they cost? <laughs> well, the barrels for rainwater harvesting, they cost around $50 to $200 per barrel. The following barrels are shown here. Um, we think that the 
best price is the one at Walmart, the 55-gallon water barrel, for only $54.99, plus tax, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, installing green roofs cost about $10 per square foot, and we decided to cover up the the um T yeah the T hallway. And that's 200 by 20 feet, which would total around to $40,000 in total. And on the green roofs, we decided to put foods, sources like carrots, potatoes, tomatoes, and onions, etc. We intend for these sources to go in the cafeteria, which could help and make the food healthier. And the plants we chose to also go on the green roof would be stone crop, moss, and serpervium. I cannot pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> we, also d we also decided to put compost so it can help and not be as polluted. Another approach that we um, also like decided on is like donating the crops like to local like food sources like just for the goodness of the community. But yeah, thank you for listening. I'm Anaya Item. And <laughs> <laughs> One more thing. Um, this is our pro. This is our project. Um, can, can you yeah pass okay. it around? We'd love okay. to see it. Um, that is the rainwater harvesting. Those are the downspouts and the rain barrels, and then that's all the tea hallway. And then right there is the green roof, which will go like like to the on the hallway next to mm -hmm. the T one hundred hallway. And like those are the flowers, the crops, and compost. Is that a lot of that? that Good for that you guys. Yes. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Nice job. Nice job. Okay. I like the flowers. The flowers are a nice touch. Yes. yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Seth. I'm Logan. <laughs> my name's Kira. And my and my name is Nikolai. And this is our 3D green infrastructure model project. We chose green roofs and permeable pavements because of the benefits of, for the community and the school. Some of the benefits include lowering our sewer bills, and it could also reduce runoff. <clears throat> permeable. permeable pavements allow for any runoff to seep and down into the ground to become groundwater instead of flowing into the sewer system. The green roofs would allow for rainwater to fall into them and be used by the plants instead of falling down to the ground and becoming runoff. And the water that does become runoff would cause less damage to the roof because it would be slowed. The green roof represents the green roof and the plant looking things represent the bigger plants, while the green swirls represent the smaller plants. The brown swirls represent the food that we are going to be growing for the school. The cotton represents the permeable pavement, and the green roof and the permeable pavement is covering all of the available spots so we can get we can reduce as much runoff as possible. The reason we think this green infrastructure is worth it is that it yields food, it's cost effective, it reduces runoff, energy use, air pollution, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and our sewer bill. 
It also mimics the natural water cycle, which helps ensure that no water is lost. Um, the green infrastructure that we put into place is quite pricey at first, but it is cost effective in the long run. Um, the permeable pavements would cost roughly about $400,000 to cover all of the like, sidewalk around the school, and the green roofs would cost about $1,700,000. Thank you for listening to our presentation. Two young ladies come back up. Okay, one oh. had to leave. Okay. Bye bye. <laughs> so, f just come up. So, and I think the board members are going to want to see that presentation too. We're passing mm -hmm. around. It's awesome. Great. So, first, uh, Ms. Underhow, thank you again for this opportunity you provided for our students. We're always looking for creativity, and you provided an awesome opportunity for them to express their learning in a very different way and hands-on. And um, the administrative team came back and was so proud of what they saw. I told my team, get them here for the board. I wanted to board in the community to hear. All you guys did an awesome presentation. Thank you so much for sharing this. We have some gifts for you, and we would like for you to take a picture with the with the board. If that would be okay, we'll take a picture with the board members. Would that be okay? I, can okay. I just add I one quick say, thing? Yeah, no, so, um, Go ahead. you guys, that was incredibly impressive. Um, I know that I'm speaking for all of us when I say that that you know what you did here today, and and all of the different disciplines that your projects represented. Yeah, this was about science. But, you know, you're also telling me about, you're, you're talking about surface area and square feet. So you're talking about mathematics. And you're coming up here and speaking into a microphone in front of a large group of people who you don't know. And that's hard as heck. Um, and so that's courageousness and it's also language arts. But this whole time, I bet I wasn't the only board member here who was thinking about, we have a very, very active member of our community in our schools who is a bona fide NASA scientist. Um, and he is often talking to us and reminding us of the importance of project-based activities that get our students diving in and swimming around in the science that they're learning. And I think that what you have shown us is a wonderful example of that. And it, it's a great um, reminder of the importance of uh, his words that we need to heed more often. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, if you can hold your project, yeah, then I get the yeah, hold your project. Hold your boards. Uh -huh. Hold your boards and Oh, you got to hold the boards out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A million seven, huh, for the We're all family here. Scooch you in like you know each other. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait to see what you guys bring us next year. Uh, we have the student reports. Caroline. <laughs>
Yeah, students. Caroline's alone. Yeah. Are you solo tonight? No. She, uh, I think he had a All right. conflict. Oh, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Hello, I'm back. Um, <laughs> All right, let's see what I got for you. Um, one of the many Heights open houses is happening December 21st. So it's, it's a chance for alum to come back and see the school and community members, and they really get a kick out of that. See our beautiful new building. Um, that is from 6 to 7 on the 21st. Treats, tours, and spirit wear will be available. And a gospel choir. And right yes, after. at 7 right after, if you want to stick around, we have a gospel choir is going to be singing some songs for us, and that tickets are $5 to get in. And that's super great, all of the holiday music and fun stuff for the season. Um, also, starting tomorrow, high schoolers are taking finals. Super excited about that. Um, <laughs> it's really great. You're exempt from all your yes. finals. Can't wait to get home so I can study. Um, <laughs> and those are through Friday. So I think that's it. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we have two statements from the audience. Both Melissa's. Uh, Melissa Sh uh, Shuck? Shuck, yes. Shuck. 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 So come on up and <laughs> you're going to talk about curriculum development in the age of testing. Yeah, I feel like I'm probably one of many parents um, who are, um, I'm kind of new to the district because my daughter's six years old. and. Um, I am also um, a scientist. I used to work for the USDA in uh, teaching farmers and ranchers um, about um, sustainable farming. And um, I also worked in the classroom um, with little ones. So um, um, what I'm um, noticing, and this is because I guess it's, it's like the age of tests. There's tests and they determine funds. and that um, pressure can be a little, can trickle down. And um, I want to reiterate what probably others have said about um, focusing on um, teaching children in ways that have, through research, have been proven to increase the children's test scores as well as their love for learning, as well as a number of other positive behaviors. Um, because we're not just teaching the children to, for this year, we're teaching an elementary school, how to, an elementary school student, how to do well on their tests in, when they graduate from high school. So they need to in, have that love of learning. And um, I work right now, um, I volunteer at the Garrity School Garden and try to get kids outside in the, um, and um, so I actually looked up the research to, pr to provide to you. Unfortunately, I only saw four pictures on, I was looking at the school board website, so I printed out five copies, you guys can fight over them. <laughs> um, uh, but it's a research summary on Okay, so you take the kids outside, um, and they've tested the kids before they went outside, and then they took them outside to some things, and they tested them again, and their scores improved, and they analyzed all sorts of things, and like two pages of research things attached to the back of the summary. Um, so just one quote out of this. Uh, research has documented increased standardized test scores, enhanced attitude about school, improvement in school behavior, improved attendance, and overall enhanced student achievement when students learned in and about nature. Um, it also decreased symptoms of ADHD um, and um, helped improve their emotional um, state, I guess, and behavioral state as a whole, uh, which when you're trying to learn, if you can focus longer, you're going to intake more information, and that information will probably come out on test scores as well. So um, although tests might, might seem like, I mean, we should put the kids on more worksheets so they can, you know, get it into their head, um, it actually, research has indicated that actually take them outside, um, do some of the, the traditional methods, and be creative with your teaching, which the 
teachers, I, I, I'm very impressed with the district so far. And I'm always telling all my friends all about the wonderful district. Um, so that's, that's it. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Do we have a way of contacting you? Is your okay. name, contact information on any, any one of these? Thank you. It's the way I can go through the Good. school, too. Excellent. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Melissa Wood. Thank you. I've written something because I tend to be uh, verbose, so I'm going to try to stick to my five minutes, okay? So if I can find a place to put it. Uh, good evening, board members and Superintendent Dixon. My name is Melissa Wood. I am a parent of two children in the district, as well as an alum and a substitute teacher at the high school for five years. I have a master's in cultural anthropology and all but the final student teaching semester of a teaching certification from John Carroll. I tell you this because my views are informed by my education as well as, my, as, well as by my experience. I am here to comment on recent developments at the high school that I find disturbing. In the last few months, we have had police with dogs in the building doing a drug search. The principal at the high school has also described a new policy for dealing with students in the halls that sounds very much like zero tolerance. I don't know how the policy will end up being enforced, but it threatens suspension for kids in the halls without passes. No intermediate consequences. Any, any disciplinary policy that involves the criminal justice system and or removal of the students from the school environment contributes directly to the school to prison pipeline. Such policies cause serious harm to our students, specifically our black students. African Americans make up 13% of the population but 74% of people sentenced to prison for drugs. Prisons are racist institutions. Our criminal justice system is a racist institution. State test and punish policies are racist. Why is our school feeding this system of social injustice? I believe we have an equity policy. And I thought some commitment to restorative justice. Or is this just lip service? In my time at Heights, I have built strong relationships with teachers and students, especially those in the special education department. Have we thought that maybe lack of student engagement is what leads to kids skipping classes? Have we engaged teachers and students in a discussion about how to address failure to attend class? Drugs in the school are a problem, but they are not the most pressing problem we have. As we search for a new superintendent, we have to have in place the kind of policies we want to see perpetuated. We need disciplinary policies that are focused on teaching, not punishing. We don't need to remove students from school, but find a way to make them want to be in class. If we write referrals, the consequences should not be in-school detention or other punitive measures, but the creation of a community of support for that student. This is possible. It is being done now by teachers at Heights. Every teacher in our district should have a copy of a book that I failed to bring with me, but it is called Teaching for Black Lives, and it's published by Rethinking Schools. We also must make a real commitment to restorative justice that involves not just administrators, but teachers and students. Students need to be on board. Their voices and their understanding of disciplinary issues are needed in the discussion. And finally, restorative justice requires the development of an anti-racist curriculum. In my experience, our most disengaged students are being given the most disengaging curriculum. This can be changed. I have ideas. The teachers at the high school have ideas. We don't want to be a school where white and middle class children hoard the opportunity. You need to talk. You need to talk to the teachers informally. 
Ask them what is working and what isn't. Listen to their concerns. And talk to the students. As board members, you must spend time in the school. And what, when you see a Heights kid pushing back against the rules, I suggest you consider the following quote by Malcolm X. That's not a chip on my shoulder. It's your boot on my neck. We live in a racist society. If we value equity as a community, we have to teach for social justice, and we have to build anti-racist schools. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think you know how to get in touch with me, some of you. So we have a consent agenda before us. Do I have a motion? <clears throat> I motion that we approve the consent agenda as presented. A second. So we've had this in front of us for a couple days. There was one question that, Molly, you asked. You and saw. it was answered. It was answered. And I am happy. Um, if there's no other questions, can we call? Oh, do this include the donations? No. Or is that separate? I was for, yeah. So we've, we, yes. we received some really amazing donations that I think, you know, uh, deserve a mention. Um, our CTE program received a couple cars. Um, they got their first hybrid uh, donated, a, a Prius. And... Um, I'm trying to find the name of the donors for that. Um, and, and, uh, and a second car as well. Um, we, um, oh gosh, I'm sorry. I should have had this open. The Prius was donated by Richard Silver. Mm -hmm. Right, thank and you. And the Honda RVP by Vera Brown. Yeah, and so, um, you know, as we talk about, we saw tonight these amazing young people who are learning um, really valuable skills, valuable in terms of their careers and valuable in terms of these are skills that we all as consumers need. Um, the community support of these programs through things like these automobile donations are, are, you know, f fantastic, and really these are the sorts of things that, that where an individual is changing the education that we're putting in front of our kids, and so that is, that's just great and, and much appreciated, and um, so I just wanted to take a moment to recognize those. Yeah. And just to be clear as far as the agenda goes from a procedural piece, we do have business services on here, but I see the folks from PMC, you're you, you're going to present to us. Yes. Okay. So do we, do we want to let's pull that off the okay. consent okay. agenda? So because it involves some change orders that I think we need to do, talk about. Do we need a motion for that? Um, no, I can pull that out. <clears throat> you, you can just pull it out, Scott, mm -hmm. can't you? So we have a motion. If there's no further discussion, can you call the roll? All right, Ms. Wright. Yes. Mr. Posh. Yes. Mr. Hines. Yes. Ms. Serena. Yes. Ms. Lewis. Yes. Thank you. Business services are Doug Myers from PMC to talk about the middle schools. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> We're rounding third. That's right. Let's see if I can find this. There we go. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, as you mentioned, I'm Doug Myers from PMC, and we do have our team here with Jack Kellogg from Turner and Ann Hartman uh, from Moody Nolan. If we have any further questions, uh, basically we'd like to give you, um, we have a request for several change orders, and we'd like to give you an update of the budget and the status of the project. Great. When I get done, Jack has uh, kind of a construction update and some photographs. Perfect. Okay. So the change orders that we have tonight um, involved uh, a lot of requests that, that we have from the owners improvements to the project. Um, we've, we've been working on, on these for quite a time, going back and forth on the best way to do some of them. Um, they include the uh, refinishing of the cupolas, so we have those before you this evening. Um, we also have uh, tackable surface modifications where we had uh, built in alternates to the project that were accepted and as we're developing the project we decided to make some modifications where we're actually putting tack boards inside the classrooms as opposed to what we had so um, they kind of balanced it out but, but we do have uh, some tweaking with deducts and a little bit of an ad for those. Uh, in Roxborough, I have some photographs um, and, and some plans to talk about some of these other ones. But we also have the uh, special education bathroom at Roxborough, um, ceiling modifications at Roxborough, the interior signage that we have. Um, and, and again, for Roxborough, we also have the cupolas. So these are some photographs of the existing conditions of the cupolas. So it's it's nice that we can go ahead and get these into the project. And they're going to go ahead. They'll they'll strip them down and prime them and paint them. Um, and the cost includes scaffolding and all the work necessary to be able to go ahead and improve these to refinish them. So we're going to be pulling funds from the project versus PI money. Correct. For these. Okay. Yes. Uh, this is a plan of the uh, ADA restroom that we're going to put into Roxborough. So we can see inside a classroom, uh, we're going to build, a, they have a vestibule so you can come in off of the corridor, you can go into the restroom or go straight into the classroom. So there's a separation there, so it, it gives some flexibility for, for usage of that classroom. Why is there a circle in the plan? Uh, that is a, a symbol for a wheelchair turn, turn, turn so radius. that shows that we're meeting the ADA requirements. And then this, this plan and section show uh, the Roxborough uh, cafeteria ceiling. Um, as we got into construction, we had originally designed the project to have some exposed uh, structure inside the space. And as we started to do some demolition, we realized that it was not going to be appealing to, to see there. And it would be too costly to try to, to move, you know, electrical and conduit and stuff out of the way. So this plan actually shows that we've raised a ceiling. We've, we have a continuous ceiling. Uh, we have uh, main ductworks that you can see in blue that's actually going to be lower. And then the squares are actually uh, pendant-mounted light fixtures, so it kind of breaks up the space. And uh, Moody Nolan can speak a little more to the design if you have any questions. But another part of this is we have in, an alternate that, that we're requesting um, to have a nicer light fixture inside the center of the space. So we'll make it a little more dynamic, a little more aesthetically pleasing inside. And that's in the tall section that was revealed, right? Yeah, the, the tall so, so the the existing skylight area yeah. that'll be closed off so that the, the whole ceiling is going to be flat inside that it'll be space. on the same plane then. yes okay yep so it's a drop ceiling you're going to be putting in yes is that the yep putting a drop ceiling in as, as high as we can we're going to drop the ductworks below that and we're going to drop some pendant mounted fixtures around you know in those the square areas the ballpark of how how high the, ce the ceiling's going to be off the ground Oh. Okay. Yeah. Cafeteria yeah. on a high ceiling. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, the, the ductwork in blue, that's a main duct branch, and that is lower. Um, and that, that's kind of matching the existing condition that we have in the space now. But we're trying to bring everything yeah. up as much as we can. So we're losing a lot of ceiling height in that room? I'm trying to envision no, where the skylights so. are. I mean, you, there were, you didn't know that they were there. The before. skylight was, but, was well. They were covered. They were covered. It was covered before. Right. There was a plaster ceiling at about the same level. Oh, okay. So, it, yeah. so it'll still. I mean, we're really then, you know, except for the the vents, we're really not losing significant ceiling height, if any. 
Okay, that's what I was right. trying to get after. If you okay. walked into the cafeteria at Roxborough and up one stair, crossed it, and walked out the other side, you'd walk underneath the skylight. Uh, so those are the change orders that we request, and as a project update, um, these are the same numbers that I, I show you every time we present of what we're managing towards for the um, owner hard cost and soft cost contingencies. Um, I wanted to kind of give you an update with, with this um, being December. So the items for Monticello, um, the blue items are what we're requesting. Um, some of the forecasted and pending change orders that we see coming up. Um, the big one, as we've mentioned, we're, um, we're looking at trying to buy furniture. And so we have been working with Moody Nolan to make some selections and to get some preliminary pricing of those. Um, we'd like to be in the position in January or February to actually be able to come to you, you know, with that request so that we have enough time to order that and have it available. And then with Roxborough, I'm sorry, this is hard to see, but this we have a lot of forecasts that they're they're minor items, and as we've as we've discussed, we have allowances within the project, so we're still working back and forth whether it's appropriate to have a change or an allowance. But as we're managing this, we wanted to be able to show you all the costs. So the outstanding forecasts are the 386, right? yes, 386,000. Yeah. And a big part of that is the furniture. And so with furniture for Roxborough, we have the media center shelving, um, which is a big part of that. And was, that it's part of the salvaged. delta between yeah. the two. Yeah. And some of these will be out of allowances. Okay. Most likely, yes. Yep. So is it realistic to assume we can start getting a idea of what we think the remaining contingency in the entire project is going to be, I mean, what we're going to have available for us? Yeah, that's, that's what these show. So that as we, as we manage these, now we still don't know what we're going to run into and we still don't know, you know, what other requests we might have. But as far as the reason we put forecasted and pending is so that when we have items that come up, we can start getting costs for those to be able to, to project forward. Um, one of the other big costs that we're managing towards is we know that we're going to have moving costs. So again, we're working with Moody Nolan to start to define um, what it's going to take to be able to, to relocate from Wiley into both of the schools. So that will become a bulletin and then a change order eventually. So those, as we get closer to that, we'll put together an order of magnitude. We'll put that on this so that we can see exactly where we're at. But theoretically, that would be a forecasted item that It would, as, yeah, as soon as we have a yeah, cost. I just, not I'm hesitant to throw a number at it right now. So it just says owner okay. move in and you'll get a number okay, at well, some that's point. Okay, well that's gonna eat up. Yes, we're working towards that. Okay. So all these change orders that's requested, is that coming out tonight, is coming out of the PI money? No, nothing's coming out of the PM. Everything tonight is coming out of the owner contingency we have okay. within the project. All right, thank you. Yes. Um, part of the owner contingency is for soft costs, and we've had no change with the soft costs, so this is the same as we've seen several months, but I thought it'd be good to update. Um, so we were managing towards between both of the schools, 240,000. We still have 27,000 left, and... Um, Right now, we have most of the abatement issues behind us, which, which was kind of a surprise, and we spent some contingencies on those professional services. Um, we do have a special inspection agency that's required. We have them on board. We have them under contract. Um, if we run into special conditions, that might be a consultant that, that we need out of this, but I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that, that we're in a good situation with the soft costs. Okay. So this is kind of a, to, to show the overall, you know, with the contingencies of the pending and the forecasted and where we are in the schedule. You know, so at the very bottom we can see we're about 53% into the construction project. We we're approving about 48%, so we spent a little bit more than half of the, of the owner contingencies that we have in the project. And when we project, you know, buying furniture and all these other items, we're about 35%. So we still have move-in costs. We have costs associated with, for the lack of any other term, decommissioning Wiley. 
and we have some bus depot costs that we have to figure out. And I know these are where we start overlapping in what the facilities committee is. Right. Which hopefully we'll get an update on later. And I know that there's a lot of discussion, so I haven't tried to address that in this. No, you right know, and nor, nor, nor should you, but I'm just trying to think that, not that I'm trying to spend the contingency, okay, because I know it needs to be out there, but I know we also have these other costs lined up. Right. We also put in half, you know, $500,000 or so for the kitchen. Yes. It would be nice to be able to really get that, get those monies back into the PI budget. We also, at uh, the Bond Accountability Commission's most recent meeting, um, one of the members brought up the overall condition of the asphalt parking lots at both Rocks and Monty. And um, George, who's not here tonight, was aware of their, they're not in good shape. And there's nothing um, in the bond uh, related to that. It's uh, a life cycle issue um, that may have been sped up because of the additional wear and tear of all of the heavy machinery, but um, that's going to be something that we're going to be looking at. Uh, George is getting prices for that, and his, his uh, assumption is that that's going to be just a, uh, a PI expenditure in the not too distant future. But just to sort of put it on the radar of the middle schools. Well, that's a good point. I mean, and there's probably other things there too, which frankly is mm -hmm. a contingency item. I mean, if something's getting beaten yes. up because we got right. construction vehicles. Those those lots, rocks in particular, hadn't had much attention to it in quite a while. The asphalt at rocks was was it's been there a long time. That's about it. Is that yep. it? Yes. Okay. So we have a uh, change. Or we have change orders in front of us. They've been presented to us earlier. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Do I have a second? Do we have any other conversation before we hear from Turner? I would just add that that uh, the Bond Ac Accountability Commission did uh, review and discuss everything that uh, that Doug has brought to us, and um, we're well aware of it, and. Uh, I think it is safe to say that the um, that it was accepted and, and agreed upon. Good. I call the call the vote, please. Ms. Lewis. Yes. Ms. Wright. Yes. Mr. Posh. Yes. Mr. Hyde. Yes. Ms. Serini. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kellogg. Hello. Welcome back. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Um, so the first pictures we're going to look at are uh, Monticello. So this picture here is the, uh, the, the mezzanine area, which was the former cafeteria. And this is the corridor. So you're walking down the corridor. Those are all the new walls. And then this is a divider wall, which is perpendicular to the corridor. You can see the framing is done and the wall has been insulated. And then this is the um, fluid cooler, which is outside the uh, gymnasium at Monticello. This is the um, coming off the truck. And then this is actually installed on the pad. And then um, this is uh, just a shot of the crane putting it in place. Uh, this picture is pretty hard to see, but it's some of the top of wall conditions where we had to either patch or re reinstall um, the top of wall for, for um, fire rating. And this is a um, ceiling soffit in um, Monticello ready for finishing compound. And this is just a typical classroom with the, uh, the duct installed. The walls have been uh, the plaster has been patched and the ducts are installed. The, um, you can see the, the soffit against the window has been patched and the duct is insulated. Okay, so that's Monticello. Let's see if we can get Roxborough now. There we go. All right, so Roxborough, this is the uh, wall in area C, which was the media center. There was a concern that the wall was leaning slightly. Um, so you guys authorized um, some structural... Um, improvements. So these are uh, angles that were expansion bolted into the block wall and then you can't see but there's a stiffener plate welded to the existing beam. So this is designed to just hold that wall in place. Uh, this is a picture of the um, 
an old roof curb which was removed and then a new much smaller roof curb was installed so that's on the roof what's a roof curve a roof curb is a base for a piece of mechanical equipment there we go this is another condition the old unit was much bigger here's the roof curb so the unit will sit on there then there's penetrations through the curb for the duct going into and out of the unit. So this roofing was a, a white type roof that was a ballasted roof. So we matched the existing conditions. We worked with your uh, roofing consultant, Greg Taylor, and he was involved in all the roofing work. Uh, this is, uh, unfortunately, it's really hard to see. This is uh, duct work in the attic at Roxborough. Did quite a bit of work up there. And um, here's another picture of duct. This is all new duct run in the attic of Roxborough. This is a typical classroom. This was a wall uh, that was in poor condition, so we removed the existing wall and are reframing a new wall. You can see the, uh, the new duct in that room. And these are the bathrooms. This is the wall where you walk in the bathroom this way. The, um, Fixtures are here where you go to the bathroom, and this is where the sinks will go. So the um, we reframed, or we will reframe for a new wall. These are the carriers for the sinks, and then this is another picture of um, some roof work at um, uh, Roxboro. So that's what we have for you. What about being on schedule? We're on schedule. Um, let me give you some of the some of the good news that's happened recently. We have the Permanent power is on in both of the buildings. The temporary heat is on in both of the buildings. So those are two big milestones. So even though it's been fairly mild, you know, we've got provisions in place for heating the buildings. Um, you saw that we have a lot of the roof curbs installed. We're starting to set the equipment. We'll probably have two or three more picks to set some of the big rooftop units um, onto the roof. The boilers are placed in both the buildings. Um, so now we're going to start piping to the buildings or to the boilers. Uh, we talked about, you saw there's a lot of duct work, um, a lot of the electrical services in. So really we're transitioning from the heavy mechanical where in January, February, we're going to start with doing some painting, um, getting some ceiling grid in, that kind of stuff. So we're transitioning from the heavy MEP more towards working our way into the finishes. So we're still on schedule for July 3rd completion. And um, that's where we are. I was in both of the middle schools today for the stage drapes project, which I'm working on sort of parallel. And the structural repairs to the ceiling in the Monty gym have happened, which was a previous change order where we were worried that there might be some issues there. Um, and the scaffolding that they put up is very convenient because it really gives you a good view of what's going on with that ceiling. So, you know, that, that's good. proceeding apace. Thank okay. you. All right. Thank you. So moving on, making sure I'm not forgetting anything, we have our superintendent's report. Okay. I would like to recommend action to approve the lay finance committee members. Oh, yeah. So you should have that list of members in your... Packet. We had it just for your view and to their approval, and then we will have it as a public view. Okay, so just sort of refresh the board. We have a policy, kind of a new one that we agreed upon, that uh, Dr. Dixon, mm -hmm. for a ongoing committee such as the Lay Finance Committee, Dr. Dixon uh, brings forth a series of recommendations. So we have nine recommendations in front of us. We have one of them, number nine, is the City of Cleveland Heights representative, and that's to be determined. I have um, asked Carol Rowe to give us a council member who could join us. Um, the issue is their council's a little bit in transition right now because Cheryl Stevens has submitted her re resignation, and there's a new member coming in, which is going to change their committee dynamics. So she would like that set before she names a committee member. We also have a committee member from um, University Heights. We worked with uh, Mayor Brennan 
um, and their finance director um, is going to serve in that capacity. So, um, Jim, I'd like to mention he's also a UH resident. Oh, yes. right. Yeah. yeah. So he applied separately. For the city he lives in. Yes, yeah, he okay. works for the city he lives in. This, so, yeah. Um, yeah, I'd like to name the members. Did, does anybody have any? I mean, the the, the recommendations before we before we right. vote on it. Yes, we can name it. We just haven't contacted him until after. Wait. Makes sense. Right. We wanted you to approve them first, and then we would contact them to let them know they. I mean, it's public record, so I mean, it's kind. Of, I mean, now that you have it here, so I mean, I can't. Okay. So we have Adam Dew, Scott Gaynor, Maximilian, uh, Gerbach, uh, James Patrick, uh, Gaff, Goffey, I think it's pronounced Goff, Goff. Mm -hmm. um, Quadrice James, our principal at Fairfax, um, Kathleen Petrie, uh, Jim Posh, the board liaison, uh, Ryan Ruth, and then the ninth member, uh, City of Cleveland Heights representative. Uh, so we'll notify. If, if we get our approval? Yep, we'll notify them all tomorrow morning. So do I have a motion to approve these members to be on the Lay Finance Committee? I motion that we approve these members for the Lay Finance Committee. I second. Okay. You want to call the vote? Ms. Ray? Yes. Mr. Posh? Yes. Mr. Heinz? Yes. Ms. Serini? Yes. Ms. Lewis? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so there was some talk about having a meeting in the January, February time frame. Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> can we yep. get? We will set a date and yeah. let everyone know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Can we get that date set? Yep. Yeah. We'll uh, have that date tomorrow. We'll let them know the date when we call them tomorrow. Yeah. Can you run up? Can you oh, run up yes. by us just so we can also make sure that mm -hmm. we got that a clear schedule? Okay. Um, and then the advocacy committee is part of my update. The application period ends December thirty first. So once we get that list of applicants, we'll be bringing that, I will be bringing that to the board for you to vote on those members. So those will be the two ongoing committees um, that would apply to the new board policy, right? Okay. And the applications for those committees are available on the website and yes. have been pretty prominently circulating around Facebook as well, so. Okay. Oh, okay, good. good. And I think it needs to be said you know, I feel like one of our roles as board members is to reach out to members um, in the community that we know would mm -hmm. be um, good applicants. So, for example, when Melissa Wood emailed um, me about presenting to the board tonight and wanted to know, you know, how to do it, it's like, you know, by the way, we've got this advocacy committee. I mean, this is kind of up your alley. I think you should look at it. Right. Um, you know, likewise, we have you know, really good members of the um, Heights Coalition yes. that should also be contacted. And, you know, I've, I've contacted two, two of those good. members. I, but I think if you guys have I will folks, do this. Yeah. you should. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we also have, since we have the, the new committees, just wanted to give you a brief update, too, on the task force. So we have the Family Engagement Task Force. Um, that's directly aligned to strategic plan goal three. We have 20 members of that task force. The next meeting is January 9th. And as a reminder, that task force is going to um, bring forth, create a three-year family engagement plan. So that is the task of, of that group. Okay. Um, the wonderful consultant by the name of Sally Braley Parker is leading that group. The early learning task force, we have our first meeting on January 16th. Uh, we're finalizing the consultant, um, but we have 15 members who we've selected for their task force. And their recommendation, their outcome, is they're going to bring a recommendation to the board in June about what um, the early learning program should look like for the district. So that they will be bringing a recommendation, whereas the Family Engagement Task Force will actually have a, um, a three-year plan that they will produce. And two of our members will be working on the the Early Learning Task Force, we have Beverly and Dan, which are members of their task force. Okay, okay so I also like to approve, uh, well, a motion to approve a high school, a Heights High Diploma to a Sergeant Robin, Robert Decenti. So Robert Decenti is a United States Army veteran who served in the Vietnam War. In 1968, 
he left Heights High before graduating to join the military. After the war, Sergeant Decente was able to obtain a GED and went to work at the steel mills in Cleveland. He is now 70 years old, retired, and living in Arizona. And he reached out to Dan, um, and we have um, worked with the high school, and we were able to um, provide him with his diploma, um, if you prove it tonight. Yeah, it's just been a, a fascinating and, and wonderful surprise to help uh, this, to get to know this man a little bit. Um, he, uh, uh, you know, his country was at war when he was in high school, and he and some of his friends um, dropped out and stepped up. Uh, and um, it has been, I, I think it is safe to say, it's been a regret of his his entire life that he never finished. And it's very important to this gentleman to get a diploma from his Heights High School. So um, he went to great lengths to do this. And um, it's a real testament, I think, to him, and as well as to um, his memories of this community and of that school and of his friends and wanting to kind of go full circle with it. So it will be a real pleasure to see that this um, Sergeant Desenzi gets his diploma. So well, let's do this. Let's, let's, yeah. let's, let's do it. Yeah, yeah. let's yeah. Really do it. Um, I move that we approve his diploma. I second it. <laughs> Can you please call the roll? Mr. Posh? Yes. Mr. Hines? Yes. Ms. Serini? Yes. Ms. Lewis? Yes. Ms. Wright? Yes. So that means that Dr. Dixon and Mr. Posh will get to sign it? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, That's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. And we'll mail it out to him tomorrow. I think we should Maybe. see if he'll come. <laughs> no, and, yeah. that's, that's I wouldn't put anything past him, actually. I know. He's, yeah. Yes. <clears throat> okay, so I want to update you on the consortium CTE coordinator has been selected. We have oh. um, Katrina Myers um, from CMSD. She's worked there for the last 15 years as their coordinator. Um, she's well-versed and respected in the field at the local and state level. And the consortium is excited about her leadership. January's 14th would be her first day in the district. And the CHUH would be her home base. So excited about Katrina. Um, the Kiwanis Club, so the Kiwanis Club, we're, all the um, advisors have been selected. We've had training last week conducted by some charter members. Uh, one of the charter members was actually a leader of the club when Bob Reinhardt, I'm sorry, when Bob Swagger was in the was uh, Kiwanis Club. So, um, and Julie Walker, he was their advisor. So it was nice to see some of the old members here do the training for our teachers. So excited. We have um, 10 teachers who are going to lead those clubs, K-Clubs, Builders Club, and the Key Club. And we have a fundraiser tomorrow night. So if any of you are available, please stop by the Melt between 6.30 and 8.30. Um, we have our fundraiser, our first fundraiser tomorrow night. Um, just as a reminder, our One District, One Book for 2018-19, that's directly aligned to strategic, strategic, um, strategic Plan Goal 2 and 3. It's our second year of doing this, and we have our author, Jacqueline Woodson, who is a famous African-American author who would be here. Um, the date is April 30th. It would be held in the Heights High Auditorium. She would do a book signing for students and a book talk with parents. So it would be a, a big event, and we're going to make sure we publicize that. And I know there was some um, questions about us partnering with some of our schools to let them know about the event, and we're going to share that Eight information. Um, April 30th. Cool. And um, Toys for Tots. So this is our third year that the board staff has been giving to this wonderful organization. And so yesterday they arrived and picked up seven large boxes of toys that was donated by our staff. Last year we donated over 200 toys. This year we had more than that, but it's all by our board staff. So we exceeded the goal, and it was so exciting to have the men in the military uniforms to come in a U-Haul truck to pick those gifts up and just know that we are giving back to students and uh, to families in our county 
um, and it was just wonderful. So it's something that the board staff has been doing for um, the last three years. And then Kids Book Bank of Cleveland. So um, I had an opportunity, Yvonne Wallace, who's a media ancillary at Noble Elementary, coordinated an opportunity for us to go to this warehouse in downtown Cleveland where they have used books and we actually, um, it was interesting, we didn't realize we were gonna be working, but we, uh, she introduced us to the Kids Book Bank and we spent two hours packing books. So thank you, board member um, Beverly, for coming. We had administrators and teachers from Noble, Fairfax, Roxborough Elementary, Canterbury, Oxford, and Garrity. Um, and it was, it was fun. Yeah. It was dirty, but it was yeah. fun. <laughs> but we're looking, uh, her goal was to introduce our district to it so we can partner with them and have them, um, us to go and volunteer and provide books for our families here in Cleveland Heights. So wonderful um, way to do it. And the media ancillaries were there as well. So it was two hours of, uh, of, of fun um, last week. So the final thing I have for my report would be the first reading of our policies. So you have those. So I have um, Dr. Lombardo, if you would come up, please. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Um, there is a, no need to take action, but this is our first reading. Our policy committee um, has started to meet, and um, the first 10 policies are in front of you. These have to do with your bylaws. Most of them are bylaws. Uh, again, this would be one of three readings. We'll bring this back two more times. So if you had any questions uh, at this time or if you wanted to send me those uh, questions as well, um, be happy to answer those for you. Well, I think um, one of the things that we as a board <coughs> brought up a while back was um, the possibility, th throwing around the idea of having opportunities for more public comments and that's one of the policies that's in here <coughs> and I don't think it should be set in stone until we've continued our conversation as a board and made a decision about what we want. I think one of the things we were limited, I mean we were limited in how we were noticing our meetings. I mean, okay, so one of the big conversations I think that Dan brought to the table was the desire to do public comment during a work session, right. mm -hmm. just like we do public comment here. Mm -hmm. And there's issues regarding the sunshine laws that would prevent us from doing that unless we change the format of those meetings, essentially. Well, the, I think the, the, the consideration was that you must, um, the, any comments during a work session must be related to the so topic the that is noticed. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. that was the the issue is that if, if you do want to allow public comment, um, it must it must be related to the topic because you have to you have to identify the specific topic of the work session and the purpose for that meeting. So that if anyone wants to come and, and, and have a conversation about that or hear about that, they know what they're coming to hear. So, so you know we're having a work session on Oh, let's see, one of our favorite topics, data, right? Uh, state report card and data. That is noticed in advance. Correct. Mm -hmm. If somebody wanted to come and make a statement on that topic, how would we ensure that they don't veer off to discuss other things which haven't been noticed? The but presiding officer has to direct them back to the topic or tell them to That's sit huge. down. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. use the little gavel thing here. Mm -hmm. yeah. You haven't banged it recently. It's so. not fun to bang. Yeah. Okay. It's very loud, especially <coughs> with the microphone. Yeah, it hurts my ears. So, um, so let's say that, yeah, let's say that we're, we're talking about data and I'll pick up where Malia left off and somebody um, wants to talk about the Toyota Prius uh, donation and um, they veer off and, and we gavel them. Uh, we tell them that they're, in this case, literally out of order. And they, um, they stop or they don't stop. Um, you know, they just, they're really excited about the, about the Prius. Um, so so there, 
this is a this is all related to the critically important in our democracy um, sunshine laws. So we make every effort to follow sunshine laws. Um, are what if any jeopardy are we in if someone goes you, you know if somebody goes rogue what is what is the what is the well i mean you 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 see these pictures on cnn where you have a security guard pulling someone out of a room and you know and you know, right. we are not going there no no okay. right but um, and that could happen at any meeting though somebody could go could, rogue at any no, meeting sure. i mean just, i think okay so let's look at how big of a problem this really is um and let's go back to the work session we had about the middle schools where we had a lot of concerned teachers and parents in the room that wanted to speak so the purpose of the work session was for us to learn more about what was going on okay and so here we would have people in the audience who would be talking about things that were totally foreign to us because we didn't even get any basic information yet from staff and I think it was important for us to get that information before we hear 300 people complaining about a situation that frankly we don't know anything about now afterwards we had opportunity, I mean, some of these people, I mean, first of all, I mean, if, if someone has something to tell us, whether it's rogue or whether it's not, there's vehicles in place where they should tell us. You know, I look, you know, tonight about the testing, Melissa's racial uh, in, uh, social justice issues, you know, these are things as board members we need to hear and we need to process. And we need to then go back to, you know, staff to, you know, help us better understand. Um, I didn't see anybody, no teacher, nobody from the middle schools approach us in our next meeting where you had an open mic and you could talk about anything Absolutely that you true. wanted to do. And they did. Absolutely true. We did have people contact us for, via email mm -hmm. and we responded to those. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that is, and when you sort of look at the number of people that, okay, besides the kindergarten teacher talking mm -hmm. to us, with that little exception, we don't have a lot of people standing up, you know, wanting to talk in the open mic. So I, I mean, I personally don't think we have a problem where people don't feel like they could reach out to us. However, I think we need to remind folk that they can reach out to us via email. They could call us. We do have an opportunity when they can speak to us. I know um, Susie Kayser is writing an article for the Heights Observer about this particular topic. Um, so we have, we do have concerned citizens that are wanting to make, wanted to remind people that they could reach out to us. I, I guess what it all boils down to is I'm afraid to change policy when something really doesn't feel like it's broke. Well, and I would also add that we can, if it, if we do feel like it's broken in three months, four months, nine months, we can change the policy. Oh, right. right. And we should if it's broken. Right. But that's the purpose of Sunshine Law. We have to abide by the Sunshine Law according to board members, according to the board. Right. Right, because we made an oath that we would. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, so, I mean, we could be in legal jeopardy if we didn't abide by that. Right. The law of the sure. land. That's what we should be. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. <clears throat> so we have two more readings of these policies. Right. So, yeah. All right. So that's it for my report. Okay. So we have a five-year forecast conversation. That was not part of the consent agenda for us. Scott, you want to walk us through that? Yeah. Um, so the five-year forecast, which, as you know, you all approve on a monthly basis. Mm -hmm. um, so we are on the cycle doing that. Um, uh, th this five-year forecast uh, for December is the same as the one that was in November. There is no, um, there have been no changes uh, of any substantive nature um, uh, 
since you last approved uh, the forecast in November. So uh, the only thing that's changed here is the title on these. The, the numbers are identical, and the, the assumptions that are involved are identical uh, to the previous five-year forecast that you approved. So, Scott, when you present this to us next month, yes. there was an article in the um, Plain Dealer about uh, disclosing the uh, property tax reappraisals and the ones that were amended by uh, the county. Mm -hmm. So I don't think this has any assumptions on those reappraisal values. Does uh, it, does, it does not. No, no. The the five the 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 well. It assumes it assumes what we were given by the county initially, and then it has that flat line okay. moving forward. So if there is a significant difference because of, of uh, residents requesting uh, revaluation of their property, uh, the county will have to notify us what that is, and then I would make the adjustments. So that really wouldn't be included in here? It would not be included at, at all. this so, point. No, okay. no, no. Now, as soon as we know what those numbers are from the county, though, you're absolutely right, then we'll, we'll Then you would have to in. change it. Yeah. should be adjusted. Yep, okay. absolutely. And then it would change your projections moving forward right. as well? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. All right. All right. Okay. And I just want to remind anybody who's looking at it that if you look at the fiscal years between when you're looking at re the real estate taxes, correct me if I'm wrong, Scott, but there was this accordion effect. Yeah, the bump. Because there was an incentive to pay your taxes early last correct. year. That's correct. So yes. therefore, that's why that number is fluctuating that way. Correct. Good point. Mm -hmm. so. That incentive will not be there this year correct. to pay nope. early. Yep, that tax law has changed, and that ship has sailed. <laughs> so um, we need to get this on the record and approve this. Do I, do I have a motion? My motion that we approve the five-year forecast. I second. Would you like to call the vote? Ms. Wright? Yes. Mr. Posh? Yes. Mr. Hines? Yes. Ms. Serini? Yes. Ms. Lewis? Yes. Anything okay. else from the Treasurer's office? No. That's it at this time. Okay, the board president report. So we've got a couple things here. Uh, updated everybody in the superintendent search. We are meeting uh, Thursday at 6 o'clock. And we're doing that in person, or are we doing it as a phone? There so was question. good question. Uh, it ended up it was going to be a phone meeting. Um, but we'll all be here together. We will all be here together. Right. I, I didn't feel comfortable with the phone meeting, so I asked if one of the three can join us, and okay. Janine is going to join us. Good, good. Thank you. Yeah, I think it'll be a lot more meaningful to actually see someone. Mm -hmm. um, I'm eager to get the results of the survey. Um, Mike has shared with me that there's very clear themes that they had already s started to see. Great. Uh, he thought the time was very constructive. Um, I sat in a few, well, I, most of you, um, we all saw last night at the public meeting. Um, and thank you for staff for putting that together at the yeah. last minute, because at one point we weren't going to have one. Um, it turned out three people showed up, but at least we did our- Three we, more voices. Yeah. yeah. Three more voices. It was important to have something in yeah. the evening, so we, we responded. Um, it, interesting, you know, Shaker's running this parallel process with ours. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe Mike can share with you some of the comments he shared with me. I, I think we're in a good shape. So it's pretty clear, though, that um, the Shaker person is going to be very different than the kind of person that, that we would be likely looking for. So hmm. I think when we go through the profile, we, we, we can get a better sense of that. <coughs> um, I've got two things on my list that I'd like to discuss, but let's make sure that we discuss them in our committee reports. One of them is the facilities committee, so let's make sure we have an update mm -hmm. there. There is also a yeah. committee a report you wanted to Care bring up for the Heights Foundation, and if yeah. there's yeah. others, we can I'll, do I'll that. Yep. that file just um, in case. It doesn't matter. Either way. Um, enjoyed reaching Heights' annual meeting. Oh, uh, I think several of us were there in attendance. Mm -hmm. It's sort of a great okay. way. To force ourselves to go to that meeting, yeah. I know we've got conflicts that night a lot, so it's, it was was really good to see. 
um, in our weekly or biweekly meetings with the superintendent, uh, we talked about um, our self-evaluation as a board. Uh, that's something that we're going to need to take care of in January. Okay. Um, there's some thoughts that I believe staff was going to look at and then present to, to Jody and I, and then we can go back to, to all of us and we can do that. I think this is one of the first times a board has ever attempted to do a self-evaluation. I think it's healthy. Um, also in the spirit of evaluations, um, so we're sort of halfway through the evaluation cycle at the end of this month for Dr. Dixon. I mean, it really doesn't make sense to do sort of a mid-year evaluation, we, we feel, with, with Talisa because you're moving on. I do think doing an exit interview is really important. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. So we'd like to conduct that. Um, Scott, we would like to do a uh, just sort of a, a, an updated evaluation that we gave you, we'll kind of see where we're at. I mean, we think these evaluations are meaningful, and if we don't sort of live by them, it's you know, why do them? Right. So, so and we think they're important. So, um, so I emailed a. Um, child labor sweat free resolution that initially was prepared i think it kind of came out of some work that the heights coalition was doing mm -hmm. and with ari klein our union our teachers union president and dan um, i shared this with all of you at the last minute so we don't have to act on this tonight because it was last minute but if you've read it do you have any questions do any of you have any Thoughts on it, or do you, or should we just postpone this until January? I thought it was pretty solid, yeah, given yeah. the short time frame. Yeah, I read through it and thought you did a really nice job. You, those of you who worked on it. You haven't read it, okay? Then let's live. Let's give Beverly a chance. Read. I mean, I just got it out there, and then I, I didn't hit the share button to share it with all of you folks, and Molly had brought that to my attention. <laughs> so I was I arguing with Google so. is what I was doing. Yes. <laughs> I read it briefly, but I would appreciate. The chance to read it through mm -hmm. okay. good so okay so good. let's so let's take that up in january then okay. um so i think we've been blindsided with the new way that the state is going to be looking at some of our buildings regarding ed choice and it's complicated and i think it needs a work session so one of the things that we decided to do is do a January work session to have a much better understanding of why buildings are being put into Ed Choice and why we can't get them out no matter how hard we try and how good those schools perform. Mm -hmm. So that is something that needs to be discussed and maybe this is something our new advocacy committee can deal with. I mean, this is you know, I'm thinking we need to do some legal action. I, I mean, I don't know. There's something that is just wrong about this um, and how we're being affected by sort of a meaningless, crazy calculation. So this is going to be an important work session in January. This is January 22nd? 22nd. Okay. 22nd. So that is all I have for you tonight. We're going to do that during, yeah, that's 20 seconds, sorry, never mind. Yeah, it's just our regular work session. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so now, board committee reports. I know we have, at a minimum, of two. Facilities oh, nice. and what else? Um, PTA two. Council and BAC and yeah. facilities. That's, that's okay. enough. Can you start with the facilities? Sure. Uh, Molly and I are on the facilities committee, so feel free to jump in, Molly, if I forget something. But uh, the meeting we had, trying to when we had this meeting, December 14th. 14th. Um, so it was last Friday. Gosh, it yeah. seems like a long time ago. Um, the first thing that we did was we um, talked about a couple of community groups and individuals we need to reach out to, and we um, to just talk about the facilities, one of them being like Noble Neighbors, since that's in their neighborhood. Uh, we divided who was going to go make those contacts and that's something to do before our next meeting. 
We also um, looked at some maps that Van Aken Aachen or Van Aken Aken is putting together, and they have taken our building maps and they have worked um, with each. Well, the principals are filling out those and they're color coded, so we can call things the same thing. Because what we found is when you're looking at a map and you know some of the spaces have been modified, so we truly know how much classroom space that we really have. Um, in the decision at some point of whether or not we close one, two, or maybe even three elementary schools, we have to make sure we still have enough space for the classrooms that we need. So we'll be looking at that data and looking at that also with enrollment and, and how our, our um, pieces fit. So it sounds like, you know, why is that taking so long? Well, there's a lot of intricate work in there. Um, some of the spaces are not called consistently, so staff is working to come up with a common language. So, you know, if it's a division one room or a special ed room, we're at least using the same term so we know that, you know, maybe all the green spaces or all the pink spaces on the map, we can figure out how much square footage we actually are talking. Um, we also talked about um, how, you know, that the busing and busing could impact depending on the number of schools that we close. And you know, that leads us into the bus depot. There are um, situations with the bus depot that we think that we at least will need to ask for an extension on our existing lease out at Park Synagogue. And that is something that um, Malia and George have ha had some initial contact we, with the city of Cleveland. We met with the Cleveland. executive director of Park Synagogue uh, a week, I think, or two weeks in advance of his board meeting. And so he's going to. Um, bring up various options to his board of directors to see what they're amenable to. So we have to see um, if it's viable for long term or at least um, if we know we end up having to move the bus depot back, we're going to need some time to do that. So we need some options on what we might have to do with that lease. Um, the committee is also looking at costs for if we do move the bus depot back, how much that would be. Um, we know that the original plan was that the bus depot would come back, and so there will also have to be a discussion with the City of University Heights if that were going to happen. Um, and, you know, the one thing that we did say is we do need to recognize that there are very limited options for the bus depot, so that is one of the reasons why that's becoming a, a factor we have to consider pretty early on. And... Then we talked about some follow-up meetings that we will need to have and some other data that we need to get, and we will have our next meeting in January. Did I forget anything else, Amalia? Oh, no, I think, I mean, the, covers. The, the most important thing is working out a consistent nomenclature for the floor plans yep. so that we can really compare our buildings to each other because things are not being used the way we think they're being used necessarily. So, <laughs> So one of the things that we were looking at, or I know we had discussed, is there a way to sort of chunk it? So instead of actually looking at this is how much um, noble costs versus Roxboro. Um, oh, you mean utilities of costs and yeah, stuff? So yeah, just, yeah, we're looking at averages on that. They're yeah. like putting together some averages on that. So, so one of the goals was, okay, so if theoretically we closed one building, what is the fiscal and student impact? without mm -hmm. a particular building being named, just using some average. Absolutely. You know, what if we did two? What if we did three? Mm -hmm. You know, what is the impact of this? And then I think, you know, looking at sort of the preschool issues, I mean, I think that's where some of the work in the preschool community is going right. is, is to dovetail right. into this. Well, the, you know, the things that we can average are the expenses of running a building, transportation can be, you can get a rough number. Um, where it becomes difficult, interestingly enough, is with students because we have some big variations um, in the number of classrooms or the, or the current number of students in buildings. You know, if you look at the population of Canterbury at 400 kids versus the um, population of Garrity at 200 and whatever, you know, that, that's 100% spread in terms of how it affects kids. So that's where it gets more difficult. So we can start with some rough ideas, but very quickly we're going to need to become more specific because then it's about, you know, relocating 400 students, for example, is a very different 
proposition than relocating 200 students. So, you know, yes, you can average out utility bills and, and the cost of custodians and things like that. But once you get to the kids, it gets complicated pretty quickly. So, I mean, I think what we were trying to determine is really, truly what is the economy of scale, mm -hmm. um, which we, you know, nets out to savings. I mean, we know whatever we do, okay, we, we have overcapacity. We, yes. we know that. Um, we don't know how much, that's the first which is thing what I think what we're trying to figure out. That's the first thing we need to figure out. Yes, we've all seen the charts, and you sort of look at the square footages, and you realize that's just not going to work. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the actual but, use of the square feet is is what matters right now, and then we can start getting an idea of whether it's going to be order of magnitude one building or two buildings or three yeah. buildings. Right. Mm -hmm. I still think we need to sort of get an idea of what we're uh, gaming for. Um, back when we first started phase one of the facilities, mm -hmm. the, the, the thought at the time was um, we didn't need two elementary schools. We'd be able, well, no, yeah, two. two. We would close two, two, and that was based on the OFCC allocations numbers, their, you know, their rules for how many square feet yeah. each kiddo yeah. is supposed to have in a building. Right. Well, it'd be sort of interesting just to sort of see if we revisit it, <coughs> really what does that mean? So, I mean, maybe this exercise that you're right. going through is right. going to help determine and, that. And also what the exercise is doing is making sure, as we stated, that we have the same, we're looking at the same thing on every map, the yep. same. Right. So, for example, two schools may have a space listed as a classroom and another school has it listed as an office. And it's really a, was a classroom, they turned into an office. So when we're thinking about the scale, we need right. to make sure we're comparing apples to apples. Right. Mm -hmm. And that was the first red flag. Because an office doesn't flag. need to be 900 square feet. Exactly. Well, so, only very special offices. Right. So, that was, her, so <laughs> that was the first red flag we saw. So, mm -hmm. you know, we make sure that we have that information as accurate information before we make any uh, assumptions moving forward. Right. Okay. We have to identify what yeah. could reasonably be used as classroom space. Right. Okay. Yeah. And then know how much square footage that is. Right. And that's something we didn't think we had to do, but that was when we um, when we received the maps. And so um, Felicia and, and Bob has been out in the buildings working with the principals and making sure we have the same common language um, on each of the floor plans. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'm reminded this morning I was in a meeting with the uh, several former board members uh, being interviewed by Rain Associates and the whole facilities challenges kind of mm -hmm. came up and <laughs> it was why. blurted yeah. out that, well, you know, you can't have access to any state money, you know, nobody's going to really, I mean, can you put a bond on the ballots? I mean, and then there was some discussion about that, but it kind of came down to is, um, I mean, really the only way that we can do anything is with savings, mm -hmm. and that's what I'm. You know, that's what I'm interested in right now. I mean, if right. we were to close some buildings, what kind of savings can we get? And then that becomes our budget for implementing in well, some ways. Well, it's true because we can't close a building without giving something to the community. And so, whether that we're giving the community some savings, some operational savings, some programs, some preschool benefits. Right. I mean, I think this is where we need to sort of start figuring some of this out. Um, I mean, I don't know where it's going to yeah. head, but and and maintaining buildings that accomplish our unique community priorities and and our our plan, you know, things like as we've all spoken, you know, the OFCC doesn't allocate classroom space for music, but or art we, or computer labs, right? <laughs> but, but art on a yeah. cart is not. <laughs> Cleveland Heights, Ohio. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, you know, that, you know, our community priorities are the priorities that we will continue to yeah. pursue. Yeah. I think we need to remember that the very first thing we set as our goal for this was making sure this, the whatever configuration we have meets our educational needs and improves educational outcomes. Cost savings was second. Well, that was what we discussed as a board. Um, one uh, group, Jody, that you didn't mention, but I know is on your radar in terms of the bus depot at um, on Mayfield as it is now is 
there were some considerations that we need to engage the city of Cleveland Heights with as well. Mm -hmm. so like yeah, yeah. That's, that yep. was yeah. cause, because we need to get city permission in order to right. extend our uh, conditional use of that space. That facility. And we can't apply for an extension of the conditional use until we have an actual lease. So that's yeah. why we went early. Ducks in a row. To, yeah. That's why we yeah. went early to the executive director of Park yeah. Synagogue because yep. we've, we've got to make sure that we know what we're doing. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Any other facilities, community questions, thoughts? Good job. So just working off, you were going to talk about the Heights Foundation. Yes. So um, I have a, a brief update from Juliana, who was here being recognized, quite rightly so, as a Tiger Team Member of the Month. Um, the Heights Schools Foundation is um, very excited to announce uh, yet another partnership with our wonderful Cleveland Heights Libraries, University Heights Libraries. The library purchased a very special um, uh, digital scanner, and one of the great um, assets of the Heights Schools Foundation's archives is that we have uh, paper copies of almost every single black and gold newspaper that has been published at the Cleveland Heights High School. And now, um, as a result of the library's um, generous investment in this very special scanner, we are digitizing those, which uh, I think is a wonderful um, next step in terms of maintaining that record and also making them easier to share. So um, people like Sergeant uh, Desenzi uh, may have access to see some of his old, old high school <laughs> newspapers, um, which is just great. And um, the other um, item that uh, she brought up is, um, as we heard from our uh, student liaisons um, on um, December 21st, Heights High will be open to the public from 6 until 7, right before the Gospel Choir uh, concert, which is, um, you know, always worth seeing um, and hearing um, and showing off that amazing auditorium that we are blessed uh, to have. So the uh, from 6 to 7, the high school will be open to the public. The concert starts at 7. There will be a um, uh, Heights Swag pop-up spirit wear shop. Um, that will be there as well. And um, need I mention the Heights Gospel Choir again? Um, <laughs> You're a big fan. I, absolutely. <laughs> Anything that uh, begins with uh, Bill Tarter is, is a good thing. So uh, that's the Heights Schools Foundation update. I do have a uh, Heights Coalition um, update as well. So the Heights Coalition, um, and this also harkens back to, I was reminded of this actually as Melissa Shuck was speaking um, to us about this test, test, test mentality. Um, the Heights Schools Foundation, I'm sorry, I'm getting my, my uh, committees mixed up. The Heights Coalition for Public Education um, is sponsoring a uh, community book discussion, and I'm pleased to say that the um, uh, Board of Education is co-sponsoring that. Um, and th the book is The Testing Charade by Daniel Quartz. And this is a fan this is a fantastic uh, read about this, the current state of over-testing and pretending um, uh, that is uh, all too prevalent in our um, edutocracy um, so the, uh, the books are available at, um, at Max Bax on Coventry, at Apple Tree, at uh, Cedar Fairmount. And the discussions will be on um, two consecutive Wednesdays, uh, February 6th and 13th. And um, folks are encouraged to uh, pick up the book or, or not, just come and join the discussion, hear about the book, and also, as always, encourage folks to take a look at the Heights Coalition for Public Education, which is a fantastic uh, community advocacy group that has done some um, really significant work uh, and is really beginning to get some attention. Um, recently met a state school board member, Pat Bruns, from uh, Dayton, who uh, sort of um, was 
very interested and very aware of the work that was being done by the Heights uh, Coalition for Public Education. And where's the location for the book discussion? Thank you. It's actually at the Wiley Cafeteria. Okay. Oh, thank you. Both Wednesdays. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the Bond Accountability Commission met and was happy to hear about locked-in prices, which you just saw earlier today. So, you know, the, the cost of that special ed bathroom was something that we'd been noodling over and worrying about for a while. And the fact that we now have real costs for redoing the couplas and yay. You know, that was on the list of things that we asked um, the construction managers, you know, to add to the project. And now we have numbers and they're happening. So that's all good. <laughs> Uh, PTA Council met uh, one week, two weeks ago, recently, um, and prior to that, they had a conversation where they were inviting the uh, PTA units to come in, and they're working on making sure everybody's um, um, bylaws are up to date and that things are sort of up to snuff for the state PTA rules, and that's proceeding. And that's it for me. Good. Any other committee reports? Do we have any unfinished business? New business? Seems like we have a lot of things on our plate. <laughs> As we should. Do I have a motion to adjourn? I motion to adjourn. I second. I'm going to call the roll. Great. Yes. Mr. Posh. Yes. Mr. Hines. Yes. Ms. Serini. Yes. Ms. Lewis. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.